The IRS will settle for less than you owe, but in order to convince them to do so, you will have to qualify for either an offer and compromise, which is an agreement with the IRS to settle your taxes for less than you owe all at once, or a partial payment installment agreement, which is an agreement with the IRS to settle your taxes for less than you owe over time. I'm going to explain both of these solutions, but first, who am I and why should you listen to me about this stuff? My name is Logan Alec. I'm a CPA. I've been a CPA for over a decade. I am highly sought after for my expertise on the IRS Offer and Compromise Program and other IRS solutions. I own Choice Tax Relief, where you've submitted thousands of successful offers and compromise, as well as other tax resolution services for our clients. If you'd like a free consultation, give us a call at 866-8000-TAX, that's 866-8000-829, or fill out the form at choicetaxrelief.com. All right, let's get into IRS settlement option number one, offer in compromise. Under this kind of settlement option, the IRS settles for an amount technically known as your reasonable collection potential. IRS says, in most cases, the IRS won't accept an offer and compromise unless the amount offered by a taxpayer is equal to or greater than the reasonable collection potential. The RCP is how the IRS measures the taxpayer's ability to pay. The RCP includes the value that can be realized from the taxpayer's assets, such as real property, automobiles, bank accounts, and other property. In addition to property, the RCP also includes anticipated future income, less certain amounts allowed for basic living expenses. Now, I've gone over the calculation of the RCP in great detail in my video on the offer and compromise formula. You can check that out at the top of the screen. But as the IRS is hinting at in the last two sentences of this paragraph here, the RCP has two components, an asset component and an income component. And these two are added together to arrive at your settlement amount in an offer and compromise. The income component is calculated by taking your gross monthly income, taxable or not, and subtracting out your average monthly necessary tax payments such as through W-2 withholding or your estimated tax payments because in order for the IRS to grant you an offer and compromise, you must be in compliance with your current year tax liabilities estimated tax payments. And then from that amount, you subtract out your necessary living expenses. And some of these living expenses are capped at certain amounts that the IRS provides called standards. I'm not going to go into that in depth here. I have gone to extreme depth on that topic in my offer and compromise formula video. So please watch that video if you're interested in learning more about that. So that's the income component of your RCP. Second, there's the asset component of your reasonable collection potential. We've had clients with all kinds of assets from fine art to complex life insurance vehicles to business and LLC and LP interests. But the most common five assets that people own these days, if any, are cash in the bank, brokerage or retirement accounts, vehicles, cryptocurrency, and maybe a primary residence. And I do go into more detail on valuing these in my offer and compromise formula video but here's an overview on how to value each of these assets for IRS offer and compromise settlement purposes. Let's start with cash in the bank. Cash is cash, so the IRS values cash at face value, but they generally let you knock off $1,000 and one month's worth of your necessary living expenses as calculated by the IRS's math. That's used to calculate the income component of your RCP. As far as brokerage and retirement accounts go, for these, the IRS will generally let you take a 20% haircut on the value of your account. So if you have a $100,000 brokerage account, the IRS will generally let you discount that to 80% when calculating your reasonable collection potential. And with retirement accounts, so this is not on the form 433 AOIC directly, you do have the option of calculating the net after taxes and penalties amount you would get out of your retirement account if you hypothetically liquidated it to pay the IRS. Also, if you have a margin account, at your brokerage. You can submit your margin balance from that reduced 80% value of the securities in your account. If you have a retirement account like a 401k that is inaccessible and it says as such in your plan document, we can generally get the IRS to ignore that asset for offer and compromise purposes. But of course, if you were able to take a loan or an additional loan out against your 401k, we'd have to include that accessible amount in your RCP. Vehicles. For vehicles, the IRS lets you knock off 20% of the value from the top. And the IRS does like using Kelly Blue Book for vehicle valuations. And from that 80% of fair market value, the IRS also lets you subtract any debt you have against the vehicle, as well as an exemption amount that is currently $3,450. So that figure is adjusted annually. So if you have a car worth $10,000 with a $2,000 loan on it, your includable vehicle value would be $10,000 times 80%, which is $8,000, less a $2,000 loan, less a $3,450 exemption amount for a $2,550 includable vehicle value in your reasonable collection potential. 
crypto. So interestingly enough, the IRS does not let you discount your cryptocurrency by 20% when calculating your reasonable collection potential. However, you can reduce the fair market value of cryptocurrency for any transaction fees or gas or exchange fees or other fees you may incur when converting your cryptocurrency to fiat. Primary residence. So similar to many other assets, the IRS does let you discount the fair market value of your primary residence by 20% and it lets you subtract the mortgage from that amount. Now, when an IRS offer examiner is looking at your property, digitally of course, they are probably just going to look at a website like Zillow or something like that and get the estimate of what your property is worth from there. But if your home has a lot of necessary repairs or other factors that could potentially make it less desirable than the typical home in your area, Zillow is not going to know about that, but you do. So in calculating your reasonable collection potential, don't be afraid to reduce the value of your home by the cost of repairs or other factors. And in some cases, we like to see a professional or professionals get out to the property to point out everything wrong with the home and give an estimate accordingly. All right, so you take the net monthly disposable income that I discussed earlier in this video, multiplied by either 12 or 24, want to know which one? Watch my offering compromise formula video. But you take that amount and you add to that amount your includable net equity and assets that I just explained in light detail here. And that sum is your RCP, your reasonable collection potential. That sum is the amount the IRS will settle for to satisfy your tax debt unless they can get more from you in an installment agreement based on your net disposable income multiplied by the number of months left in the IRS's 10 year time limit to collect your tax debt. But basically, that's an offer and compromise in a nutshell. I have a lot of other videos on offer and compromise. There's the offer and compromise formula video I mentioned previously. There's my video on seven IRS offer and compromise tips. A link to that video is at the top of the screen and in the description below. But now let's move on to IRS settlement option number two. That's the partial payment installment agreement. Now. Many folks don't qualify for an offer and compromise because with an offer and compromise, you have to include your equity in your primary residence, whether it's accessible or not. So what if we had the classic house rich, cash poor situation in which the taxpayer absolutely cannot pay off their tax debt despite possibly having a six or maybe even seven figure net worth if they include their equity in their home? What if apart from their home, they don't have much either in terms of other assets or monthly cash flow? Well, for these folks, a partial payment and installment agreement, a PPIA, is a way to get the IRS to settle their tax debt. A PPIA is an agreement with the IRS to pay them your monthly disposable income over the remaining number of months the IRS has to collect on your tax debt. And I'll give you an example later on so you can better understand what I'm talking about. So why might a PPIA be feasible for a house rich cash poor individual with IRS debt? Because unlike with an offer and compromise, in which a taxpayer's equity in their home has to be included in their offer amount, regardless of whether that equity is accessible or not, the IRS can agree to a PPIA as long as it is able to address the taxpayer's equity and assets. And when it comes to taxpayer's equity in their primary residence, we can usually have the taxpayer go out, get a couple loan denial letters showing that no bank is going to lend them money on the equity in their home via a cash out refi or HELOC or some other instrument. And then we can submit those to the IRS and they can sign off on the equity as inaccessible. So if a taxpayer doesn't have any other assets, but they have the equity in their home that prevents them from being a good offer and compromise candidate, and we can show they cannot access their equity. The only thing then we'd be looking at here is the taxpayer's monthly disposable cash flow. Because if we can show that the taxpayer's monthly disposable cash flow using the IRS's own math and standards is a certain amount, that's all the IRS is going to get from them every month, regardless of if it will result in the taxpayer eventually paying off their entire liability or not. And that could very well result in the taxpayer over time paying less than they owe. And this is what a partial payment installment agreement is. Yes, these are permitted by the little words or partial in section 6159A of the tax code, which says that the IRS can enter into written agreements. These are installment agreements with any taxpayer under which such taxpayer is allowed to make payment on any tax in installment payments. If the secretary determines that such agreement will facilitate full or partial collection of such liability, not just full collection of liability, it says full or partial collection of liability. So if a taxpayer grosses $5,000 monthly, but they have 4,800 in justifiable living expenses based on the IRS's math, that means they have $200 in disposable cash flow. That means the IRS will expect the taxpayer to pay them $200 a month in an installment agreement, barring any other accessible equity and assets. Now, if they only owe the IRS $10,000 and it's fresh debt and it's going to drop off in you know 10 years, 120 months, 
taxpayer would not be eligible for a PPIA because they could fully pay their liability making $200 per month payments to be a full pay IA. But what if the taxpayer owes $100,000 to the IRS and that $100,000 is older debt that's going to drop off in say three years. In this case, the taxpayers will make three years, that's 36 months of monthly payments of $200, which amounts to a total of $7,200. That means the IRS will settle this taxpayer's $100,000 tax debt for only $7,200 which is based on their monthly disposable income by the IRS's math multiplied by the number of months left the IRS has to collect. All right, folks, so those are the two main ways by which the IRS will settle for less, the offer and compromise and the partial payment installment agreement. But let me say one more thing about the partial payment installment agreement, and that it does not have the permanence necessarily of an offer and compromise. Because if you start making more money or your financial situation changes, the IRS can revisit the arrangement every couple of years. Do they always do that? No, but they do reserve the right to. That said, I've seen folks get into a PPIA and they just stay in that PPIA for two years, four years, six years, eight years until their tax debt drops off, never hear from the IRS. Well, they, they do get a you know their annual notice from the IRS, but the IRS doesn't revisit the PPIA and they've basically wiped away a substantial portion of their tax debt. So maybe a way of putting it is a PPI doesn't have the immediate finality that an offer and compromise does. Although it can be a way to ultimately and finally deal with one's tax debt for less than they owe. That finality just isn't as immediate as it is with an offer and compromise, right? In which if the IRS accepts your offer and compromise amount and you pay your offer amount according to the terms of the offer, either a five month lump sum or a 24 month periodic payment, the IRS can't go back and negotiate on that even if your fortunes change during that five-year compliance period post-offer. Another thing to keep in mind is a PPIA will create a lien. Now, don't get me wrong. Like I said, the PPIA could be a permanent solution if the IRS doesn't revisit it. Your circumstances don't change very much. You aren't making much more money than you were when you submitted the PPIA, right? That means you'll stay in the PPIA until your tax debt drops off. And really the same is true for currently non-collectible, also known as CNC status as well. I have an entire video about CNC status that you can check out, link at the top of the screen and in the description below. Before I sign off here, let me talk about bankruptcy really quickly because I know people are going to put in the comments, they're going to ask about that. Can I settle my tax debt with bankruptcy? And yes, yeah, sometimes bankruptcy is the right answer. Not all tax debt can be dealt with in bankruptcy, but some can. So why did I not feature it prominently in this video? That's because this video is titled, Will the IRS Settle for Less? And while bankruptcy can, though it certainly does not always result in the discharge of your tax debt, it is not a settlement with the IRS. Okay, bankruptcy is a legal process administered by the United States Bankruptcy Court and a bankruptcy trustee. It is not an IRS settlement. So that's why I didn't feature bankruptcy prominently in this video. Though so bankruptcy is an option for many people who owe tax debt. All right, folks, if you like this video and you want a fuller explanation of your eight tax debt relief options, including offer and compromise, including PPIA, including bankruptcy, including CNC, check out my video in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. I also have a playlist of all my tax relief videos in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. And of course, if you want to talk to us here at Choice Tax Relief, you can call 866-8000-TAX. That's 866-8000-829 or fill out the form at choicetaxrelief.com. Bye-bye.